The date, January 27th, 1967. The place, Launch Pad 34, Cape Canaveral, Florida. Mankind's most complex technological challenge of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth is about to take a giant step forward. At 1 p.m. local time, astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chaffee crawl into the confined space of their tiny Apollo 1 capsule. It's a major test prior to their first flight on an ambitious program that would lead to a moon landing two years later. The test is considered non-hazardous, as no dangerous fuels or pyrotechnics are on board the craft or its launch rocket. The Apollo program was run by some of the brightest brains and most talented technicians on the planet. Yet at 6.30 p.m. that evening, one of the astronauts reported a fire in the cockpit. Less than 20 seconds later, all three were dead. A catalogue of safety failures in procedures, designs and materials were found to be responsible. In the rush for success, the most technically sophisticated organisation had lost sight of basic safety. If those who took man to the moon could get it so wrong, might you too be in danger of losing sight of safety in a confined space? It's obvious that the confined space of an astronaut's capsule is a dangerous place. Most confined spaces we encounter on a daily basis are not so obvious. However, yet they can prove equally hazardous. In fact, work in confined and enclosed spaces has a greater likelihood of causing fatalities, severe injuries and illness than any other type of work on board a ship or marine installation. Shockingly, figures show that for every one who dies in a confined space accident, two more die trying to rescue them. Recognizing a confined space and the danger it represents is key to ensuring that essential work can be completed safely. A confined space is usually defined as any area that is enclosed or partially enclosed, above or below ground, and where there will be a reasonably foreseeable risk of serious injury from hazardous substances or conditions within the space or nearby. It might have limited openings for entry and exit, and an internal layer that could trap someone working in it. It might have unfavorable natural ventilation, where a lack of oxygen could present a risk of asphyxiation. It could contain toxic gases or dust, perhaps explosive or flammable gases, or even loose powders or liquids that could overcome a worker. A confined space might also present risks of high pressures, chemical exposure, electric shock, noise and vibration, and even slips and falls. Such spaces are usually poorly lit or totally dark, and more often than not, have restricted room to move inside them. One thing is certain, a confined space is definitely not designed for continuous occupation. In marine and offshore workplaces, confined spaces can be many and varied. They're not always obvious at first sight. They can range from cargo holds and cargo tanks to ballast tanks and pump and compressor rooms, but can also include boilers, pressure vessels, double bottoms, double hull spaces, oil and fuel tanks, sewage tanks, compressor rooms, coffer dams, void spaces, duct keels, inter-barrier spaces, dive chambers, diving bells, chain lockers and even engine crankcases. No matter the size, the shape, the nature or the location of a confined space, there are some basic procedures that must be followed by anyone who has to plan or carry out work in such an area. At first sight, these safety procedures may seem straightforward and obvious. So obvious, in fact, that carelessness can easily lead them to be overlooked. The consequences for ignoring them can be catastrophic. A procedural shortcut could lead to serious injury or death. Many workers and their families now wish more care had been taken when, on a normal routine working day, an employee at an oil facility climbed down a ladder into an innocent-looking water tank. But the tank contained a mixture of water and nitrogen, and, starved of oxygen, the workers soon collapsed. 
Spotting the problem, a co-worker immediately entered the tank in an attempt to rescue his colleague. He then collapsed too. In the few short minutes that followed, two further workers climbed into the tank to help the first pair. They too were overcome. Finally, recognizing the problem, a supervisor ordered the tank to be drained and two additional workers then entered it, wearing breathing apparatus and using safety lines. They found three of the men unconscious and the fourth barely semi-conscious. All four were evacuated. Three of them were declared dead soon after arriving at a nearby medical facility. What had begun as a routine task ended as a human tragedy. Sadly, it need never have happened. Confined spaces can be deadly, and so one simple question must be asked before any work is undertaken. Can we do the work in any other way to avoid having to enter them? Unfortunately, there's often no other way to complete an essential task without someone entering the confined space to do the work. That's why meticulous planning and practical procedures are essential. This is no time for gung-ho attitudes and ill-considered guesswork. The first step by those personnel who will be planning, supervising and involved in carrying out the work is to identify the hazards and assess the risks of the task within the confined space and other associated tasks. The risk assessment should consider the following hazards. Previous contents, residues, contamination, oxygen deficiency and oxygen enrichment, physical dimensions, cleaning chemicals, sources of ignition, and ingress of substances. The control measures identified through risk assessment will form the basis of the safe system of work. This safe system of work, which may then form the permit to work, should include requirement for supervision, competence for confined space working, communications, testing, monitoring the atmosphere, gas purging, ventilation, removal of residues, isolations from gases, liquids and other flowing materials, isolation from mechanical and electrical equipment, selection and use of suitable equipment, personal protective equipment and respiratory protective equipment, access and egress, fire prevention, lighting, static electricity, limiting working time, emergencies and rescue. A rescue plan is essential as more than half of workers who die in confined spaces are attempting to rescue other workers in difficulty. Those who died in the water tank incident, for example, lost their lives because no formal rescue plan had been agreed. Sadly, that wasn't an isolated incident. When a ship's bosun fell into a slop tank prior to it being ventilated, he was spotted by the chief officer who immediately climbed down into the tank to help him. Another crewman followed shortly afterwards to assist. Soon all three were unconscious inside the tank. Belatedly, another officer wearing breathing apparatus entered the tank and the three injured crewmen were lifted free. Tragically, the bosun never recovered consciousness. The cause of the bosun's fall into the tank was never determined. Safety procedures say the open tank should have been protected by a barricade, but it wasn't. The subsequent investigation reported that the chief officer had entered the tank impulsively, ignoring safety rules and acted emotionally to help his colleague. The crewman who followed him also acted emotionally rather than logically, it concluded. Understandable though it might be, such actions ignored the rules and risked lives unnecessarily. Once the organized rescue effort got underway, it was conducted successfully and professionally, in accordance with agreed procedures, said the report. But it would never have been necessary if the safety rules and procedures had been followed from the outset. An unplanned rescue could be your last. When all the hazards and risks of the task have been considered and assessed, the permit to work has been raised and authorized, and before work commences, a toolbox talk should be conducted to ensure all those involved in the task are fully aware and understanding of these hazards, the risks and all aspects of the safe system of work to control all activities. 
The toolbox talk should also address the roles and responsibilities in the event of an emergency, the rescue plan. A safe system of work, permit to work and provision of task checklists could have prevented an ROV technician being badly burned when he was engulfed by flames while working in a confined space inside a winch drum. His routine task was to remove moisture from a rotary junction box inside the drum. It seemed straightforward, but the method he used could have cost him his life. He opened the junction box cover and sprayed contact cleaner into it. Then to speed up the moisture drying process, he used a heat gun. The instant he switched on the gun, flammable gases from the contact cleaner ignited. In the flash fire that followed, he suffered burns to his hands, face and legs. He was fortunate that he managed to get to the drum opening and call for help. The technician had ignored all the basic safety procedures. He was working in a confined space with inadequate ventilation and illumination, yet he had entered it with no permit to work and no one else present. There was inadequate supervision and no communication with anyone else. He didn't tell anyone what he was about to do. There was no job safety analysis or toolbox talk conducted before work started and no adequate control measures. If there had been a suitable risk assessment carried out, he might then at least have identified that the contact cleaner he used was flammable. The subsequent investigation also concluded that another step might have been considered, perhaps mounting the junction box elsewhere so that it could be accessed for maintenance without requiring entry to a confined space. A confined space entry, safe system of work, permit to work should address the requirement for a minimum of three personnel roles to be involved in the task. These will be the person going into the confined space, called the entrant, a buddy or safety attendant, and the task supervisor. Among the responsibilities of the task supervisor is ensuring that the work is carried out in an efficient, safe and careful manner, and that all necessary precautions are taken. It's their responsibility to carry out a toolbox talk and to ensure that all personnel involved fully understand the hazards, risks and risk control measures. The supervisor must brief the entrants on the methods of safe access and egress and ensure they have all the necessary personal protective equipment. Meanwhile, the safety attendant should understand and identify the hazards faced by the personnel entering the confined space. It is their responsibility to monitor all activities near to and within the confined space and to maintain constant visual or voice communication with those entering that space. It's also vital that they are in communication with watch personnel, for example on the bridge or in the control room. The safety attendant should remain at the entry point at all times and be prepared to summon help in an emergency and assist in any rescue. Under no circumstances should the safety attendant enter the confined space themselves or leave their post when there are entrants within the space unless they are replaced by another competent attendant. Finally, the persons entering the confined space are responsible for ensuring they are aware of the potential hazards associated with the work to be done. They must keep in communication with the safety attendant and alert them if there are any signs of exposure to hazards in the confined space. Only those authorised and trained for the task should enter a confined space or act as a safety attendant. An authorised gas tester is responsible for checking the presence of flammable vapours, toxic gases or oxygen deficiencies or oxygen enrichment before work begins. Dangerous gases or vapours can come from scale or sludge in the space or be created by operations being carried out such as welding, cutting or painting. Ventilation and oxygen monitoring are essential when welding is being performed in any confined space. The authorised gas tester must make an informed assessment to establish whether or not the proposed work in a confined space can be performed safely. 
The golden rule is never to trust your own senses to determine if the air in a confined space is safe. Many toxic gases and vapours can neither be seen nor smelled, nor can the level of oxygen present be determined. Where the atmosphere inside a confined space is considered to be suspect or unsafe to enter without breathing apparatus, then work should only take place when it is essential for the safety of the ship or installation or the safety of life. To recap, therefore, before any work is carried out in a confined space, check is the work essential? Can it be done in another way? Has a full risk assessment been carried out with all those personnel who are to be involved in the task? A safe system of work been developed, a permit to work raised, authorised and issued, and a toolbox talk conducted where all control measures and roles and responsibilities fully understood? Has a rescue plan been prepared in case of emergency? Has all the required personal protective equipment been issued and checked? When the work is about to begin, has the atmosphere inside the confined space been checked by an authorised gas tester? Are all those who enter the space or act as safety attendants fully trained and authorised? Are all entry and exit routes identified? Is a trained rescue team with breathing apparatus or other personal protective equipment standing by? Confined spaces are dangerous places, especially if safety procedures and risk assessments are ignored. Those responsible for the crew of Apollo 1 didn't conduct a full hazard assessment. They didn't study the capsule's entry and exit procedures. They didn't assess the flammability risk of the oxygen-rich atmosphere in its confined space. No properly equipped rescue team was available nearby and the crew's personal protective equipment was not sufficient to save their lives. No one foresaw that disaster which took place during a routine non-hazardous exercise. Three men lost their lives as a result. In the days before the disaster, the astronauts were worried about standards and about safety. Frustrated at a lack of progress, they resorted to offering prayers that all would go well in space. They never got that far. Sadly, prayers are no substitute for essential confined space safety procedures.